D.R. Perry, Diana Perry, welcome to Behind the Fiction. Hi. We were just talking before we went on, trying to decide whether we were going to do video or not, and you whipped out an instrument to show me that you were ready. Yeah, there's a couple of things. Uh, you know, I mean, I got all fancy, first of all, with the lip gloss <laughs> that I don't usually put on because it uh -huh. just gets stuck in my hair. <laughs> oh, the writing light. It kind of goes where it wants to go, and yeah. And then, um, you know, I, I wasn't... Maybe I wasn't totally prepared, or maybe I was, because I got on the mom hoodie over here. You know, yeah, so, so you're ready. Hide, yeah, I can hide from the mom friends that I don't necessarily <laughs> want to see all the time, or I can do my Emperor Palpatine impression. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, actually, as we talk about the different things you write, there are different ways that you could go with the, with the hoodie look to tie it in with the series. <laughs> The hoodie look. I don't know if that's a thing, um, unless you're like uh, gonna have a lot of pumpkin spice coffee this this autumn or something. Yeah. Uh, so we are recording this on September nineteenth. I am in Florida, and mm -hmm. it's like ninety two degrees outside, and you're wearing a sweatshirt. You're in yes. Rhode Island. Yes. So I'm already jealous at the fact that you said the word autumn. Mm -hmm. Is well, it nice and cool up there, or is it, it? It is. It's beautiful. It's like it's those nice crispy days. Uh huh. You know, um, not like not like crack snapple pop. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, but it's nice in the morning. You get like that little bit of, it, and it gives you the motivation to walk with more power. Yes, I, I'm a mom and I power walk and I wear hoodies. Okay. Uh huh. Mini man. No, no, I don't. A Prius. I got a Prius. <laughs> It's got a lot of stickers on it. Um, maybe by the end of this interview, you might be able to guess what some of those are too. Oh, now I've got to, now I've got to really ask some probing <laughs> questions to try and figure this out. <laughs> so first, I mean, this is sort of an introduction to the LMBPN audience of Diana Perry. Mm -hmm. You've been writing, I, I see the first published book that I see on your Amazon list is from 2016. Yes. So when did you actually start writing? I've been writing kind of since I could write. Um, I've written a lot of really goofy sort of things that um, I wish I had. I, I had a fire, so I lost a lot of really early stuff. Oh. Yeah. Um, but this is why I always say to people, oh, I'm just going to delete this whole thing I wrote. I didn't like it. No, don't delete it. Save it. Stick it on a thumb drive somewhere or, you know, just put it out of sight. If you don't want to lay eyes on it, great. But trust me, in 20 years, you're going to wish you saved that Star Trek fanfic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is one of the first things that I actually wrote and showed to other people. I wrote a Star Trek episode about a food fight because the, um, the food processor was malfunctioning. And yeah, so uh -huh. I, was a goofy, I was a goofy kid and I was always a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> so which version of Star Trek is this? Oh, it was the original series. This was okay. I, I'm dating myself here. This was before the next generation was even out. So all right. So thankfully we have video and everyone can see how old I am. You look <laughs> you look very youthful. You do not have the same hair tone that I have. It's the hair. <laughs> it's it's I, it changes color. Um, I think the last time I had a meeting with the LMBPN staff, it was really bright orange, and now it's sort of the salmon color. Um, <laughs> oh, it's been it's been green, it's been blue. It's had purple streaks in it. It's been bright orange. It's been pale orange. It's been pink. Uh, it's just you name it. <laughs> so this is a thing of yours? Sort of. How long? How long have you been doing this? Um, well, I, I took a break for a while. I worked, um, I worked in healthcare for a little while, and I didn't do any crazy colors then. Uh, I just was Auburn for a while. But um, yeah, when, when, I was, when I was a teenager and uh, all, the, all the kids were dying it with Kool-Aid, I I missed that phase entirely. I did not know there was such a thing as dyeing your hair with Kool-Aid. So that's interesting. So uh, for give give our listeners a sense of the kinds of things you write because they all kind of fall into one family, but they're also all different. And you you've got at least three different series that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. So um, I do write a lot of different things, but I really I have trouble trying to keep the werewolves and the vampires and the uh -huh. fae and um, or spaceships or computers with AIs out of it. You know, it's it's just kind of hard for me to write something that's normal, uh -huh. <laughs> I guess. Um, and you know, 
contemporary, I've seen lots of contemporary books and I sort of envy contemporary authors sometimes because they have to come up with all of these crazy plots and things that happen without somebody having to deal with the fact that they turn into a wolf once a month or <laughs> that, you know, they need to drink blood to survive and they miss their garlic bread. Um, so, you know, I just, I just, I write a lot of things like that, but usually I do, I, I try to be very character focused. Um, this comes from me being a nerd. Uh, I was in uh, LARP for about 15 years. Um, I played the same character for nine whole years. She didn't get killed. <laughs> I managed to, <laughs> I managed to not have my character die for nine years um, in a, in a, in a LARP chronicle. So that's, I guess that's an accomplishment. Yes. Yeah. Put that on your life list. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there was, there was that. So I really, I do try to focus on the characters and think about how they feel um, before I think about necessarily what they're doing, because I always uh, wonder what's, what's motivating somebody. They're always going to be motivated by uh, a feeling or maybe something they know or something they've heard, uh, whether it's true or not. So I really try to try to like kind of zoom in on the character. Um, and I love when they make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes the stories interesting. Yes. So let's, let's talk. You've got three separate series that we're going to talk briefly about, and then we're going to focus on one because you've got uh, an omnibus that's, that's coming out shortly, yeah. published through LMBPN for that. So we'll, we'll focus on that, and then we'll, we'll come back with a separate episode to talk about the others. But the first one we're going to talk about very briefly, and then we'll get into some detail later, is Providence Paranormal College. Yes. So that's a 10-book series. Did you, <laughs> did you know that was going to be 10 or more when you started that? You know what? I knew it was definitely going to be at least eight or nine books um, and probably somewhere around 10 or 11 books. I almost wrote an 11th book. Um, but then I realized the characters who would be the, the main characters in that book needed to grow up for a couple of years. So I will be revisiting that series um, because there's a piece missing from the end. Uh, and I guess I have this fan, uh, Daryl, and he's awesome. Uh, he's from Canada and he hi, just, hi, he just <laughs> read everything in Providence Paranormal College and he's like, where's the rest of it? And I'm like, I know, don't worry. It's there. <laughs> it's just going to take a while. Um, so without giving any spoilers, there's, there's one loose end I leave. And um, that's because again, I thought it was going to be maybe 11 books. By the time I got to book seven, I knew it wasn't just going to be eight or nine. Um, because the characters, some of the characters grew and they, uh, sort of needed to be heard. So one thing about this series is it's a magical school. It's, you know, yeah, it's one of those, oh, we go to magic school books. Oh, this is <laughs> awesome. We got trays levitating with pizza on them and hamburgers and stuff. Um, and we got vampires and people using magic and we got werewolves and it's an integrated school so we have all supernatural types so it's a little like legacies that way if you watch the show legacies they've got vampires and witches and then they've got um werewolves and then they've got other i guess is a uh -huh. category there um but we have providence paranormal has all these types um but it's a book it's a book uh series where each book has different main characters in it so, yeah. yeah, and um, they're all sort of part of the same Scooby gang, and they're all friends, but they're not, um, their stories have different pieces that their lives and their experiences and the stuff that they're learning at school um, helps contribute to the larger plot of the series. Okay, so the second series, or I, I'm not sure sequentially when you were date-wise when you wrote these, but the second one we're going to talk about is the Supernatural Vigilante Society. Mm -hmm. That's different, a little different. Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, I got this idea. First of all, I thought, oh, I really love Daredevil. I was watching Daredevil. Uh -huh. I, was like, I, love, I love Matt Murdock. He's this Catholic hero who has to grapple with Am I doing the right thing? How far is too far? Uh, you know, and, and his morals are Catholic. I'm not Catholic, but my husband is. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, wow, what if somebody had to, had to be Catholic and be a vampire? 
And then I was like, ooh, what if they were Italian and Catholic and had to be a vampire? Because Rhode Island is a very Italian place. We've got lots and lots of uh, just Italian everything here. Mm -hmm. uh, the food's amazing. Come to Rhode Island and, and eat. If you're in Rhode Island, do not skip lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Do not skip dinner. Go to the nearest restaurant. Eat something. It's it's we have the, some of the best restaurants in New England. Um, so I I thought you know what if what would and what would this guy be like? I also didn't want to write about an old vampire. Um, so I wanted to write what is it like when you're just starting out. Not, oh, I've got all this power now and I'm so bored. What am I going to do? I look like a teenager. I'm going to go to high school and I'm bored. No, I didn't want to write that. <laughs> I wanted to write, oh, I'm a vampire. I can't go to church. I can't eat garlic bread. I can't eat any food at all. I love this bakery down the street from my house and I can't even go there anymore. What am I going to do with myself? And Valentino decides he's going to help people. Because okay the kind of person he is. All right. And we will get back to that series in a separate interview, but that mm -hmm. sounds interesting. And then the, the third one, I, I can't even pronounce it. So you just La say Familia, it. La Familia de Mostri. It's a family of monsters. Uh, and this is a mop. These are mafia books. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's just like completely different. And when I'm looking at the mm -hmm. blurbs, I'm like, oh my gosh, these look like they're fun. So another thing in Rhode Island and a lot of New England around prohibition time was the mafia. It's just something you kind of can't get away from when you look at uh, the early 20th century in this area. And I love the 20s and the 30s. Um, it's my favorite. I was so enthused when Fantastic Beasts came out, um, but I wrote these before that. So these books are about what happens when monsters and magic Combine with the mafia. <laughs> and it's in the 20s it's, in Rhode yep. Island. And I, it, it just seems like such a rich uh, mine that you could uh, dig into. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. There's um, the first book focuses more on the monsters. And the second book is more about the magic. Um, I, I did a diverse cast too, which is also sort of a challenge sometimes when you're writing historical books. But because um, they're supernatural and they do sort of change things um, and everything's fictionalized a bit, it's, uh, it's really alternate history. Mm -hmm. But instead of, you know, a lot of people hear alternate history and they think, oh, World War II. Nope, I don't touch World War II. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm dealing with like the lost generation here and they, um, they're the, the generation that came of age between World War I and World War II. And they have a lot in common, I feel, with Gen Z and with millennials, the younger millennials. Um, I, I know I'm not, I'm, I'm Gen X, but I'm right at the edge there. Mm -hmm. And I sort of, um, I feel like, I feel like uh, I wanted to tell stories about, about that. It's difficult when you're kind of, your foot, you know, you have one foot in two different sort of worlds. So the fact that these are, are monsters and magic users, and they're also in the process of deciding whether they're going to become mafiosos as well, it's sort of, um, there's a lot of, uh, that echoes very deeply. There's a lot of depth to that in this story, because mm -hmm. not only are they um, supernatural, not only are they considering a life of crime, they are also dealing with the fact that they are part of this lost generation between the two wars. All right, and we will again have a separate interview about that, so you can look forward to, to that as we get closer to the release of that uh, series with LNBPN. So let's, let's dig in now to Par Providence Paranormal College, and you, you, we sort of left off with that you're talking about the idea of having different main characters for yes. each of the books. Was that, did that make you nervous when you were planning this out as, as a series? No, no. No, because Actually, you were fearless or? <laughs> no, because the characters all had something to say to me. Um, they all wanted to, they all wanted the spotlight. They're a bunch of big hams. <laughs> when you read this, you, when uh -huh. you read this, you're going to, you're going to like them. Um, I, I found that, there's maybe two characters people are kind of eh about, but for the most part, people are like, oh, I want to see what this one does. I want to see what that one does. Um, 
my mother-in-law who has read all of these her favorite is blaine harcourt and he's a he's a big favorite he's a dragon shifter okay and when does when does he make his first appearance Oh, in the first book. Okay, all right. A lot, a lot of these characters, we do see them in the first and second books. Um, we meet Blaine, who is the roommate of Bobby. Bobby's the main character in the first book. Uh, he is a bear shifter who's from Louisiana, and he's <laughs> never seen snow, and he's up in Rhode Island going to school, and there's a giant snowstorm right before exams, and he can't stay awake. And the other bear shifters who are all from northern climates are laughing at him. They think, oh, look at this guy. What is up with him? What a noob, you know, all this, all this stuff. And then um, his roommate's like, no, this is serious business. He's going to flunk out. He's got a class. He's going to fail here if he doesn't stay awake and do well on the exam. So the teacher in this class, Professor Watkins, who's also a recurring character in the series, um, is adamant that Bobby passed. So he's assigned him a tutor who is the smartest student in the class. And this is Lynn Frampton. Lynn Frampton, her, she's totally mundane except for her super genius brain. She's very smart. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, also she's extremely determined and on, on the verge of being kind of bitchy. Um, and this is, this is, again, this is one of the characters I mentioned. Some people are kind of eh about her. Some people don't like Lynn very much. Um, she's not a particularly likable character, um, but she has, again, uh, just such a presence mm -hmm. that I couldn't keep her out. I, I said, okay, Lynn, fine, you're in the first book, all right? We'll, we'll mm -hmm. do your thing first. Um, the fact that she's the first and only mundane student at this school full of supernatural people is kind of a big deal. And it does um, crop up as being a, sometimes a problem in the series throughout the, the 10 books. You um, mentioned that, that Lynn sort of forced her way onto the scene. Is that your writing style? How did, explain to us what your, what your process is. So when I, when I'm in, um, a, a LARP or I'm running a, a, some sort of game, whether I'm a player or I'm, I'm, you know, running the game as like the DM or the storyteller. Um, I always look at all my characters first and I, I do the same thing with my books. So I say, okay, who are the people here? I have a place. And then I go, who are the people here? And I said, oh, I got a sleepy bear. And the book's going to be a, mainly about his problem, this book. And I say, okay, I got uh, a very privileged dragon. I know he's going to be figuring in here. I've got a werewolf who wants to lead, but he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a group of people to lead. So he's, he's like missing, he's missing buddies, you know. Um, I've got a um, super genius, right? And she says, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to fix the, I'm going to fix the bear's problem. So I'm listing these people and they're kind of coming into my, my head of, um, in a way, like characters in in an RPG. Okay, all right. And so then, do you do you go from that process to an exhaustive outline or a short outline, or do you just yeah. start typing? Um, no, I do know I do know the problem that the characters are going to have in that book, uh, and I do have some idea of what's causing the problem. Sometimes characters surprise me with what they do and say. Um, but often it's a matter of knowing point A, knowing point B, and knowing the, the problems along the way. When you're planning a 10 book series, and, and it sounds like that's what you did from the beginning, what do you, I mean, do, do you have threads that go through the entire 10 books and was that part of the initial plan? Or do you just like get halfway through the first book and go, oh, I want to explore this more in the second book or the fifth book? Or how, how does that all work? I kind of knew the different characters and the book and the stories that, that they, the problems they'd have in their stories. I didn't always know what order they were in. And the other thing I don't always know is um, I don't always know that there's going to be a thread over here that connects to a thread over there. Sometimes I think, oh, these things are gonna go all this way, but something comes up here and it connects and I go, oh yeah, okay, that uh -huh. makes sense. Yeah, so there's certain certain things, but there, um, 
the main, they're like the main threads I plan. And a lot of the subplots just kind of come and intersect. So a, a 10 book series, you started writing this in 2016. Mm -hmm. That implies roughly three books a year for that series, plus the other things you're writing. You obviously write a lot. What's, mm -hmm. What is your expected output for a year if you're, if you're just cranking along? Well, when I did Providence Paranormal College, I wrote the first five books in just about five months. Wow. Yeah, those were the first drafts, and then I had to go back and revise them. Um, I didn't publish the first book as soon as it was done. I went in and I wrote a couple of more, and then I went in and did a, did a few revisions. Sometimes that's just joining a couple of those threads. Mm -hmm. Other times it's, I am so focused on the characters, and I'm so focused on their dialogue and how they're interacting with each other, that on occasion, I this is my weakness as a writer, I guess. On occasion, I forget to to describe certain details that some readers really want to see. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you you know Lynn's a brunette. It's it's obvious. I mention it. You know Bobby has blonde hair. I mention that too. But you don't always know what they're wearing in every scene. Some people like that stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I go back and revise, I can say, oh, she's wearing a red shirt. You know, oh, he's wearing um, this blue flannel. Oh. Blaine was wearing basketball shorts out in the snow because he's a dragon and he breathes fire. You know, it doesn't bother yeah. him to be out in the snow in shorts. But, and that's a Rhode Island thing too that I wanted to put in there. <laughs> so I, I know lots of people who want to go through a rapid release process and they're thinking three books. So I, I need to just keep writing until I get to three. But there's always this sense of, I want to release, I want to release, I want to release. I've got, I've got this out there. You, you did five first drafts before you went back and started revising. What was, what was that like emotionally to do that? <laughs> um, some of it was, some of it was good. And the reason why is because the, the, those first five books, some of them are kind of short. Okay. Um, so, you know, Lynn is a very good problem solver. And so the first book, Barely Awake is the shortest one because Lynn just kicks ass in that book. <laughs> She, she rocks that problem out. She is like, I got this, right? Uh -huh. And Blaine's like, how is the normal girl smarter than me? I've been to all the best prep schools. Um, <laughs> and this is why people like Blaine. Um, so, you know, on, on certain, for certain reasons, it's, it's good not to release it rapidly. Also because um, when I was writing them, it was the first time I'd written a really long series. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wanted to make sure I did did connect some things. Um, we have some scenes where Josh, the werewolf, in the third in the in the third book, um, he's having to deal with a couple of little leftover issues from the second book. And I wouldn't have been able to connect that really fully if I hadn't gone back and um, sometimes um, added a description. So somebody's wearing something, they realize they didn't like it. Oh you know, um, they're wearing something different in the next book. Little things like that. Okay, all right. Yeah. And so for people who are listening to this and hearing us talk about books one through five and, and mm -hmm. how you, you wrote those kind of quickly and then went back through them and some of them are a little shorter than others, et cetera, et cetera. The first LMBPN release is a box set of the uh -huh. first five books. So coincidentally, so you, don't have to wait. <laughs> you don't have to wait. Those will all be out at one time. And then I'm, I'm not sure how long until the, the next one comes oh, out. It looks like it's a little over a month. It's like a month later. Yes. For the yes. second bundle of that. And that's a complete series. I put a few little short stories. Yeah. In that's really cool. There's, there's like a, a, a book and then, a short story and then a book and a short story and a book and a short story. <laughs> and t tell us about the short stories and, and were those just like outtakes from, from the writing of the books or ideas uh, that you had? A couple of them were. One of them is say Watkins and it's from the point of view of Professor Watkins who's this hard case professor who just is like you got to get your studying under control and pass my class because I don't care if you fail. If you fail that's my job security. <laughs> everybody's had a teacher or a professor like that at some point in their life. And I felt like um, he had a little more to say and I wanted to get in his head. So I did a story from the point of view um, of Professor Watkins and he is 
has found one of my one of my main characters um, sleeping in the back of his classroom because she's afraid to go home. Um, she's she's pissed off the fairy queen, and so with good reason she doesn't want to go home um, because everybody knows where she lives. So she's sleeping in school, which is neutral ground for as far as fairies are concerned, and um, he he notices this. So we see this professor who's really very got a, a very tough exterior, and we see him through the series, like I said, do a lot of things um, and deal with a lot of things. And one time he is actually the, the plot and the problem that needs to get fixed. Um, but right here in this particular story, we get to see a different side of him. And I can't tell you what that is or I'll give it away. <laughs> okay. All right. So we will have, the book is available now. We are releasing this, this show and podcast on the date of the book's release. So if you're watching this on YouTube, the, the link will be there. If you're if you're listening to the podcast, the link will be in the show notes. So please go and grab the first five books of Providence Paranormal College and, and then just wait like five, six weeks for the next group. Diana Perry, thank you so much for being here. Uh, let's do this again. Yeah. And we'll pretend it, it's like a few weeks from now, but it's really, we're going to record this right <laughs> after we record the first one. So you're still going to have I the mom sweatshirt on sweatshirts. <laughs> and the lip gloss. <laughs> So thank you all for listening. We'll be back. Uh, we'll be back with you again with Diana in a, in a few weeks.